Hello everyone, this is Joe Minardi and welcome to today's lesson in point of care ultrasound. Today we're going to go over a case of vaginal bleeding and talk about how point of care ultrasound can help us not only shorten the differential, decrease diagnostic error, but help us make a critical and time sensitive diagnosis largely at the bedside with very little need for other extraneous information. Here are CME objectives if you're into that kind of thing. So in this case, we have a 22-year-old female who presents with some vaginal bleeding and pelvic pain. This patient's particular periods are irregular and she has no idea whether she could be pregnant or not. Her vital signs are normal, but she does appear to be in pain. As is our custom, we brought the ultrasound in the room with us when we saw the chief complaint, so we went ahead and started taking some pictures. And since this patient just has diffuse abdominal pain, we kind of start broadly looking all around, taking a survey of the abdomen. And we see gallbladder with a fold. There's not much going on in there. Here we're down around the bladder. And I'm probably going to slow down and take a look some more at some of these findings in detail in a second, but we'll get a quick run through them here. So if you take a look here in the, it looks like the left upper quadrant, we see the spleen, the kidney, we don't see any free fluid in the subdiaphragmatic space. We don't see any fluid here in this paracolic gutter area and then move over to the right. Similar, nothing in Morrison's pouch, there's IVC. We can identify the gallbladder, it's got a little fold, doesn't look to be any obvious stones or inflammation in here. And then here down around the bladder, we're gonna to start to notice some findings. We're gonna see here's the uterus, there's a little bit of free fluid and right adnexa, nothing clear, there is free fluid here wrapping around the intestine. And here posteriorly, I'm gonna pause that there, and what I want you to notice here is there's definitely some free fluid in the pelvis. And then there's something back here posterior to the uterus that should get your attention. Now this could just be a loop of bowel contained with some free fluid around it, but sometimes some complex fluid or blood clot can start to look like this as well. So that should catch your eye. It's not definitive at this point, but certainly something worth noting and worth investigating further. Again, some free fluid here in the right adnexal region. Uh, that's probably over here. Now let's see, what else do we see? Yeah, main notable findings, something posterior to the uterus, could be a loop of bowel, definitely some free fluid, but there may be some free fluid with complexity to it there as well. And moving on, so that's pretty much the findings. Just again, fluid in the posterior cul-de-sac and this uterus appears grossly normal. There doesn't look to be anything significant within it. There might be a little bit of fluid here. This could be just some blood that's not yet been ejected. Maybe some further imaging of that area is worthwhile as well. And in the interim, we've completed a pelvic exam that has showed us that the cervical os is closed. There's not really significant bleeding occurring at the time of the pelvic exam. So let's see, what do we have so far before we go to the next stage of our exam? So right now we have pregnancy, right? C chemically identified with the HCG level. But right now we have not identified the location of the pregnancy. So this is pregnancy of unknown location. So that leaves just a few possibilities of where this pregnancy could be. This could be a spontaneous abortion that's in the midst of happening, has mostly already happened. The HCG levels just haven't come down. This could be, again, there's a small percentage of normal pregnancies that just take a little longer to become visible or aren't visible until a little bit higher HCG levels. So that's still a possibility. Or this could be an ectopic pregnancy, but we have not yet identified that. It could be an ectopic that's, again, too early, too small to see, um, or maybe just further imaging is going to delineate those findings. So the next step in this patient's evaluation is completing an endovaginal ultrasound. And I'm going to show you just a few select pictures from this. So here we see this is a sagittal orientation. Remember, in the sagittal orientation, this side of the screen is anterior. This side of the screen is posterior. The patient's head is directed this way and their feet are directed this way. So here's the uterus, antiflex, antiverted. We don't really see anything with an endometrial stripe. We see something posterior and we definitely see some free fluid in the posterior cul-de-sac. And in the transverse view or kind of towards the lower uterine segment, definitely some fluid in the pelvis and some kind of mass here. Not really well defined what that mass is. Could it be bowel? Could it be some other lesion mass, could it be an ectopic? Those are all things up for debate. And then this is just another sample from a different view. And what I wanna point out here is we have two separate areas of fluid, one of which, this is the bladder, and we would more easily identify that as we sweep through, and we're somewhere close to the adnexa. This is some more of that fluid in the posterior cul-de-sac. And what I wanna ask you is, does this look like simple fluid or complex fluid? And I'm gonna tell you, you see stuff, gray things floating in there. This is complex fluid, and that's gonna play a big role in 
how we make our decisions in this patient. So here we go back to these images. I'm going to go through a quick summary of what we found and what we know so far. So the findings are we have a positive pregnancy, right? We have a uterus with nothing in it. We have a pelvic mass and we have complex pelvic fluid in this case. Although if there's enough fluid, it could be anywhere in the peritoneal cavity. So this is a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, and there's honestly very little doubt about it in this case. Always there could be atypical cases and exceptions, but uh, this is ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Certainly, only way you're going to disprove this is surgically at this point. So the question sometimes comes up, you know, who should get methotrexate? Is methotrexate or other medical ectopic therapy appropriate? Uh, maybe it, it might be suggested to you, and you need to know, or patients may ask about it, you need to know what the indications and contraindications are. And so just real quickly, medical therapy for ectopic, the times you do it are a stable, reliable patient. It needs to be a small ectopic that's not ruptured. And these other things, I don't usually keep these in my memory too much because these just go along with it being small. So lower HCG levels and absent heartbeat. So really just remember a small ectopic and realize that there may be criteria for that and no signs of rupture in a stable, reliable patient. And the contraindications are obviously a patient's unstable, maybe if they're unreliable, uh, any signs of rupture whatsoever, and then things that might go along with a, a larger ectopic pregnancy. So teaching point summary in this case, if you aren't incorporating endovaginal ultrasound into your care, it is critical. Uh, you can't truly fully and completely evaluate pelvic anatomy without endovaginal ultrasound. And in my opinion, it's for emergency physicians who kind of really see the widest range of acute first trimester pregnancy problems, we need to have this in our toolkit. And then the signs of ectopic are mainly an empty uterus and a pelvic mass. And something I like to point out and remind folks, an ectopic pregnancy is not a normal pregnancy. So it's not, it often, while it can look like a normal pregnancy in the wrong place, it often just looks like an irregular, echogenic, and complex mass. It often doesn't look like a normal pregnancy. It may just be a nondescript mass. Usually it's a little more complex, usually a little more solid and echogenic looking. So that's what that's noted there. And then signs of rupture are excessive or complex free fluid. And those are things we definitely need to be looking for and interrogating for when we do our imaging. So conclusion in this case, this is a pretty straightforward case. Uh, once all the findings have been gathered and you put the data together, this patient is not a candidate for medical therapy. The ectopic is too large. And with the complex free fluid, there are signs of rupture. So the patient went to the operating room and had resection of the ectopic pregnancy and, and did quite well. So with that, I hope that case gave you a quick little summary of the clinical approach and how to integrate findings of ultrasound and the importance of being able to do this at the bedside, especially in places where consultative or radiologic ultrasound is not immediately available. And having these capabilities will allow you to make critical decisions in patients that are at risk for significant mortality and morbidity. So thanks a lot. I'll see you soon. Get out there and scan some patients.